Hello, welcome to another Q&A session from the Reaper blog. My name is John, I run the Reaper blog. Today I have a lot of great questions that came in through the Reaper blog community Facebook group. And uh, so I'm gonna choose five of these to answer. Before we get into that, I want to thank everyone that has subscribed, uh, liked and shared my videos, left a comment, or uh, became a patron over the past year. The site, the YouTube channel, the community has grown a lot over the past year, and I really, really love the way that it's going. So uh, please keep that up. Without you guys, I wouldn't be able to do this, so thank you so much. All right, first question. First question comes from Matt. I'm getting into some heavy mixing and want to add more plugins, but can't. Should I upgrade my computer, which I built myself, or my interface? from a Focusrite USB 2 to 3. I'll probably do both anyways, but which would you do first? My first thought is that it's probably the computer that is the weaker link here. Um, Reaper will actually flash yellow if it's a possible buffer underrun, uh, the audio interface interrupting the um, processing. The transport clock will actually flash yellow. If it flashes red, that's the CPU. So um, that's kind of a good indication of which one of those you need to upgrade first. Usually the computer, especially if you've already built a computer yourself, you probably know which components are lacking. You know, maybe it's the RAM speed, maybe it's the amount of RAM. Um, swapping out a processor isn't often an easy thing to do, um, but maybe that is something that you can do depending on the motherboard. There's a whole, you know, there's a lot to building a computer and making sure that it works right. But yeah, upgrading the computer is probably the best way. Um, and then taking advantage of the things that we have in Reaper to manage CPU, like freezing tracks, um, grouping tracks within folders and applying processing there using a top-down mixing approach, using sub-projects or just bouncing down uh, things and uh, consolidating as you work. Maybe find a plugin that is more efficient that can do the same thing. Great mixes were done with a lot less than what we have now. So um, I don't really think there's any excuses. The next question comes from Barry. Is there a simple way to clear all automation in a project? This is one of those situations where you search the action list for automation and there's nothing to be found. Um, for whatever reason, anything related to automation is usually under envelopes or envelopes. So let's search the action list for that. And I know that it's something that came from the SWS extension. So uh, we'll look for uh, remove envelopes. And here it is, SWS, SNM, remove all envelopes for selected tracks. And so that's what you're looking for. If you want to delete all automation, you need to search for remove all envelopes. Often this is confusing, you need a thesaurus to find the right action. Often um, this is something that constantly comes up for me as well. Finding, when I want to delete something, I need to search for remove or clear or something else. You might also be interested in the custom action that I made. Did a video on this that will completely reset your mix back to its default state. Removing all plugins, uh, resetting the master, resetting all the track volumes, removing all the sends, all that kind of stuff. Similar to this, but goes many steps further. So check that out. There's a link in the description. The next question comes from Matthias. What's the best way to organize if I want a processing chain to change radically between verse, bridge, chorus on five or six tracks, like lead vocal, background vocals, guitars, and drums? Having completely different EQ dynamics and special effects in different sections of the song, Automating effects on same tracks seems complicated, and separate tracks for each section is cumbersome to work with. The way I look at it, either way you approach it, it's uh, not really a big issue. It's what you need to do to get the mix right. If you need to use separate tracks, then go for it. Apply the processing to those tracks, and then go back to the original tracks uh, later on. You can also bounce down that section or use a sub-project there in that section where it's a completely different sound. But I would probably do it with automation, and it's not really that hard if you're using the global override for latch preview mode. So let me show you that here. 
So in Reaper, and I want to, let's say, change a bunch of EQ settings and things like that within um, this section of the song here. So I'm going to go over to the global override section in the transport bar. And by default, it's on no global override. And I want to set this to latch preview. So now anything in the mixer and any plugin parameter is now armed to record automation. Let's see which tracks are actually playing. We can play this anytime we want. Like We can loop this repeatedly and change anything we can think of. Okay, well, here's a simple one. I'll take the EQ and I'll just turn this way down. So I'll just bring that up to there, okay? Okay, let's take the EQ on the drums and we'll also bring this way up. All right, that's just two examples. We'll take the, um, the, dr the whole drum volume. Let's just actually take all these drum tracks and I'll just bring them down, kind of grab it on the control surface, bring them down in this section. We could also add in other effects in here, um, all that kind of stuff. But just as a quick example, we've changed the volume, we've changed EQ settings on two things, and we want to commit this to this section. And you see anything that I've touched has a red tinted parameter, and any automation lane that I touched has now popped up here. So, um, so frequency of low shelf there, all the volume, now we're going to actually commit this, run this action, automation, write current values for actively writing envelopes to time selection. Actively writing means any of these that are red. Um, and so we just run this. And that's put in that automation change to its current value onto the track. And outside of the selection, it's the default value or the where, where it was before we started touching it. Um, and then we're going to go back to our global override, and we'll want to set this to either no global override or set it to read. And now these tracks are reading automation. And so there's a slight transition time here, and that's in the preferences for um, automation. So um, there's automation recording record uh, return speed. So that's the time it takes. Um, when you're actually writing it with, you know, dragging a, a fader or something like that, um, action transition time is this other one, which will apply to um, any of the actions that we run. So there you go. Yeah. So let's play that now. It's really that simple. It's just a couple steps. I have a video on how I do this. I've shown it actually in um, my mixing courses as well. I have one key that I use a lot. Uh, it's just, I press P and then go to the, let's go back to this EQ. And let's just make that nice and bassy. Maybe take out all the highs. Okay. And then I just press P again. Oops. With uh, the main window focus, I press P again. Anything I touched is now written to that section. And so that's all of these automation lanes popped up, written into the section. And it has that action transition time that I showed you earlier. So drastically changing the mix using latch preview mode is incredibly easy. Uh, it's basically one button uh, to do that if you're using my custom action. The next question comes from Def Piro. In the case of recording electric guitar or bass track with amp sims, 
does it matter to record it in real time or lay down the DI track first, then apply the amp sim to it? I would always try to get the sound that you want during the performance. You know, practice along with that amp sim and try to get it sounding uh, real nice and inspiring uh, because that's going to affect your performance. With electric guitar, I can't imagine playing like a heavy riff without hearing distortion. It's just not going to work. Uh, you're going to overplay it. You're probably going to like clip the preamp just so you get some of that um, edgy feel, but it's not going to sound the same once you put that amp sim on. With a bass guitar, often it sounds pretty good through a bass DI, um, but it's not that difficult to like set up an amp sim, do the exact same thing, and um, you're going to play a lot better if you're hearing a sound that you like. So uh, always try to do that. And the last question comes from Gavin. Why are my played MIDI recording notes on the piano roll always slightly ahead of the beat, even though they're played in time? Recently, I did a video on setting the recording latency offset. So if you haven't gone through that already, please do that. Uh, there is one sort of note, maybe um, one slight addition to that. If we go into the preferences, and uh, find the recording preference again here. If you calculate, let's say, 65 samples here, um, you might want to experiment with putting some of that into the output offset and some of it into the input. We only know the total number. Um, it might be a combination of the input and the output settings. If you're finding that uh, your MIDI input is getting offset too far early, this is where you would adjust that. Try to find the right balance there. If you don't know what I'm talking about with this recording offset, I did a video on this, so please check that out. Link in the description. And that's it for this Q&A session. Thank you so much for watching. If you want to support the Reaper blog, the best way to do it is really just by watching the videos. Um, go through the playlists that I have, watch more videos. If you like them, give them a like, share them with a friend, that's really the best and easiest way to grow the channel just by getting lots of views. So if you could do that, that would be awesome. If you don't have a lot of time but you want to support what I'm doing, you can become a patron. For as little as a dollar a month, you can get some exclusive content. Uh, sometimes I'm releasing videos early there. Sometimes I'm asking the patrons directly for some feedback on stuff. Shout out to my top patrons, Mark Kilborn, Gordon McGladry, Nezvet Sarahan, Dave Wesley, Igor Gorkin, Luca Fusi, Brian Hilliard, and Gwen Kiefer. So that's it. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Join our Facebook group, Reaper Blog Community. Support the Reaper Blog through Patreon. And visit reaperblog.net for a lot more tutorials. Bye.